Well, we were covering a lot of material this morning, and I'd like to welcome Sherry back for our, the second part of our workshop as she takes us through the thresholds of conversion in our postmodern environment. Thank you, Sherry. I, am, I, I apologize in advance for moving at the speed of light, but, um, uh, you know, within the time frame, that's what I got to have to do. But the single most valuable, practical thing I can make, you know, try and leave with you is this. How to recognize pre-discipleship levels of spiritual development in 20% of people. Because when we, if we, the one thing, we have, we've been catechized, we have lots of content. We have tremendous riches, theological riches and spiritual riches and liturgical riches. But we have, the thing we have not been paying attention to is where our people are actually starting. So we keep dumping all these riches on them and they just roll off. Because, of course, as you pointed out, the church teaches catechesis is intended for people who are already disciples. Evangelization is supposed to happen before Mass. The Catechism is very explicit about that. Because the fruit of Mass, for, the, you know, for us who attend, is entirely dependent on the disposition we bring to it. Our spiritual hunger, our spiritual openness. So, we need to be talking as well about where our people really are. So this is really, this is when I stumbled across this nine years ago, it, it really hit me immediately because I thought, this means what everyone I know in pastoral ministry knows. That there are real, that our people, the Holy Spirit is at work in our people. There are lots of good people out there who are wrestling with real spiritual things and have real spiritual hungers, but they're not yet accepted. <laughs> So we can affirm what God is doing in them and has done in them, and we can simultaneously say, there's more. There's more where that came from. Okay? There are progressive levels of spiritual development that are genuine works of grace, but not yet intentional discipleships. If we understand where somebody is coming from, we can meet them where they are and help them deliberately make the rest of the journey. So, very simply, and this is focused again on lived or living relationship with God. Not your baptismal status, not whether you're attending church or not at this moment, but where are you in your lived relationship with God? Because for postmodern people, those are two different issues. Do not make an assumption because you see somebody's body inside the church that the rest of them is there. People come for all kinds of reasons. People are active for all kinds of reasons. People end up in church leadership for all kinds of reasons that have nothing to do with discipleship. So, we talk about trust, curiosity, openness, seeking, and attention discipleship. And there are four chapters on this in the book, for those of you who've read it, um, or who haven't, would like to read it. So I recommend, you know, this is the incredible fast version. But, it came out of Canvas Ministry in UCLA, in the 90s, when some campus ministers realized that their students weren't processing things the way they used to. What used to work wasn't working anymore. So they did something brilliant. They sat down with 27 students who'd gone through a conversion that year, and they said, basically, tell us what your journey is like. And they actually listened to them and discovered that despite all the differences in these people's background and journey, they had all essentially gone through all these stages. And then they spent another 10 years working with another 2,000 students, helping them make the journey. Um, and then they wrote the book that I quote um, called I Once Was Lost, What Postmodern Skeptics Taught Us About Their Path to Jesus. <laughs> so, yes. Now, this is the really big thing. I just want to point this. Um, oh, I really am tethered. This is bad. Okay. Um, <coughs> So here we have trust, curiosity, openness, and seeking and discipleship. It's just another way to look at it, okay? But I want to point out a couple of things. One, 70% of our baptized population are not on this chart anywhere because they're not here. Set, roughly 70% are 
non-practicing, or they've dropped the identity altogether. So they're off the chart. Typically, someone who is not here doesn't even have, often doesn't even have trust. The, however, the 30% of our people who are active, that is, they show up once a month, most of them, we've slowly come to realize, are at the earliest, essentially passive levels of spiritual development. Most of them are in trust. If you don't have fundamental trust, and I'll talk about that in a moment, you probably will not show up at Mass at all. So that's a first. If, if people don't have trust, we have to build it. We know, the scandals, we're very aware because of the scandals, that violated trust, <coughs> how profound that is, how important that is, and we have to rebuild it. A few of them are in curiosity. But this is where most of them are, right here. Now, I probably don't have to tell you but if we talk about pre-evangelization, pre-evangelization is designed to deal with the needs of the 70% who are gone, and actually a lot of the 30% who are in these very earliest stages. Initial proclamation kicks in in trust. It's what helps people move into curiosity and openness and further along. And catechesis is really for people who are very far along in the journey. It, it should be offered, at, you know, probably at seeking or discipleship. Now, the problem is, roughly 90% of our pastoral effort is up in catechesis when 85 to 90% of our people are down here, or they're off the chart. So, the vast majority of our pastoral efforts are going on, are designed for the for the a very tiny minority of our people. Because most of our people are here. There is a developmental gap that is our that part of our real problem. Because we need to be doing what will help our people who are here begin to move. <coughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, we have the average cultural norm in the average diocesan parish in this country, and we've worked in hundreds of them, typically is at trust. It's at the very earliest passive level that there is trust in place. Our goal for active Catholics, for most of them, is probably initial proclamation of the gospel, fostering curiosity, openness, and seeking. For the 70% who aren't here, or aren't here most of the time. Their greatest need is pre-evangelization and building trust, rebuilding it if necessary, and fostering curiosity. So, let's talk about the thresholds in some detail. Always remember, it is a totally different, a threshold looks totally different to us who are on the inside than to somebody who is on the outside considering the possibility of making that journey. And I'm, I'm speaking here as somebody who, I was raised as a fight fundamentalist in southern Mississippi, okay? I literally was taught that the Pope, uh, the church was the Lord of Babylon, and the Pope was the great Satan or something. <laughs> and I lived two doors from St. Clair's Catholic Church. Now, to give you an idea of what not to do for fundamentalist children, <laughs> on Halloween, my brother and I were out trick-or-treating, and the sisters had pumpkin and a light out. Now, it was pretty scary. We normally would never do anything with Catholics or associate with them in any way, because of course we thought they were pagans. But, when candy was involved, <laughs> or the gospel, I don't know, you know, you had to, to be flexible at some point. So, so we figured if they were giving out chocolate, we were gonna take even Catholic chocolate. So we knocked at the door, and the door did not open. What happened was we, I heard this incredible cackle on, a, on high. And the son sister thought it'd be really cute if she dressed up as a witch and hung up over the door and cackled at all the children who came. I went, it's all true. So I'm saying sisters, though of course the Dominican habit really doesn't work well with this book, but, but I'm just saying 
have mercy on your children and neighbors, okay? It kept me from darkening the door for many years. All right. But you have to understand, for me to consider becoming Catholic was like considering becoming a Martian. So at my first RCA program, when I, I'm, I'm a survivor of three RCAs, a graduate of none, okay? So I came in and I had a book that I had picked up that said Catholicism. I knew nothing, nothing about inter-church debates and, you know, I thought they all came from the Vatican printing plant. Like directly, okay? So I just put this book under my chair and sat down. You know, the battered metal chair that's broken and kind of wobbly, right? So there you are. And the team, one of the team members, RCA team members came in, took one look at the book and said, I see where you're coming from. And I'm thinking, I don't even know where I'm coming from. How do you know where I'm coming from, you know? Okay, we cannot underestimate what it is like to come from a far country. And most of our people, even our baptized people, 85% roughly of our Gen X and millennial Catholics are in a far country. They are not here. Only about one in 10 adults in the average parish, and that adult by me, I mean between the ages of 14 and 32, only one in ten fall in that age range in the average parish. The average age is 52 in our parishes. So 85% roughly of everybody under 50 is off wandering somewhere. We're going to have to go to them because most of them will not be coming to us by themselves. It's a long journey, and we cannot underestimate how scary that journey looks from the outside. Our job is to, if we understand where somebody is in their lived relationship with God, what their experience has been like, what they understand it to be, what they understand the meaning to be, we can meet them there and be a companion that does not cause them to freeze, in place or backtrack because we somehow triggered a fear or an anxiety on their part. That's why these thresholds can be so helpful. But what looks so obvious to us because we think we're nice people and we're doing everything we can to make this simple and you know and really they'll like it and here the water's fine, just you know, jump in. And they feel like they're on the edge of the precipice. We have to imaginatively enter into their world. If we think of this white square as all the, the, every human being on the planet, about seven billion of us right now, one third of us exactly are baptized. Baptism is the road less taken, folks. We need to grasp that. Historically as well as today. This is actually one of the highest percentages uh, in history of baptized, the baptized population. As Catholics, we've tended to presume Christendom is the norm. It is not. It has never been the norm, historically. So really, the missionary stance is the norm. But one-third is our baptized. Christ is the center for everyone, whether they know it or not, have ever heard of him or not. Okay? But some of us are baptized, some of us are not. As we move closer to Christ, and again, this is about the lived relationship with God, not so much sacramental status. Notice, there are people who are moving into trust, who are baptized, and people who are not baptized. You can make this journey without being baptized, or you can be a baptized person who's back here and has never lived their life, and every variation thereof. So trust is the first essential step. What is trust? It is not the virtue of faith. Practically speaking, in most of our parishes, we act as though trust is the virtue of faith, and it is not. It is not that act of faith, that personal act. It simply means I have some positive association with the church, with Christ, with Christianity, with a person who is a believing Christian, something. I have a bridge of trust in place. Okay? I have a friend for whom was raised in a non-religious family, and the Charlie Brown Christmas special, the old cartoon, 
was his bridge of trust. The first time he knew there was a story and he heard the story, he heard Linus read the second chapter of Luke on the cartoon. That was his bridge. It wasn't until many years later that he actually encountered Christ personally, but he had a bridge. He had a positive association. Um, so, many non-practicing Catholics or unchurched people just don't have a trusting relationship at all. They don't have a bridge of trust in place. It doesn't have to make sense. I have met people who tell me, there was one guy famously did, um, he was a major leader in, in his parish, and he was doing youth ministry and apologetics on the internet and mission work and all this stuff. And I was doing a threshold conversation, I was doing an interview with him, a guest interview actually, and I asked him to describe briefly his lived relationship with God. And he froze. I've never seen anything like it. He was a warm, personable guy who just glowed when he talked about his family. He turned to ice instantly. It was like a blow watching him. His whole face, his body froze. He says, I'll tell you what I think. I'm like, oh, I'm backing up here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be interesting. He said, I, God, is like, sort of like this vivisecting monster. And if I don't ask anything of him in this lifetime, he'll let me through in the end. And he says, I should do something about that, shouldn't I? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he said, I said, finally, you know, when I got over my shock, I said, so just curious, why are you doing apologetics on the internet? He said, well, I trust the church, I don't trust God. Now, most of us, I know everybody says, oh, I'm the opposite, I trust God, I don't trust the church. Okay, I get it. We've met people who don't trust the tr any member of the Trinity or the church, but they trust the Virgin Mary. That's their bridge. It doesn't have to make theological sense. There just has to be a bridge. Or maybe you're the bridge. They don't believe any of this stuff, but they know you believe and they trust you. You're the human bridge. And without that bridge, they'll never get any further. If the bridge does not exist, the first job of evangelization is building the bridge. <coughs> Fundamental distrust, as we all know, is <coughs> especially with Catholicism, partly because of the scandals and a whole variety of other reasons. People do not spontaneously see us as good. Now what's so fascinating has been watching the response of Pope Francis. He has built bridges of trust with millions of people all over the world just like that. It's been fascinating to watch. I asked my brother, who of course is not a Catholic, because uh, I'm the only Catholic in my family since Wittenberg, um, so, so he says, I said, what do you think of the new Pope? He says, oh, we love him. All my friends and all, the, and of course, he's got a bunch of Protestant pastor friends who are ex-Catholics, naturally. And, uh, and he says, oh, we all love him. We just think he's great. Okay? I've heard all kinds of stories. People who just walk into rectories and say, I want to become Catholic. I saw the Pope on television. People are overhearing conversations on buses where people are saying, I think I'm going to I need, I need to think about becoming Catholic because, you know, whoa, what that guy is doing. He is just hitting people on a thousand levels. And in one month, he has reestablished trust for millions of people that didn't happen. Now, the question is whether we are capable of following up on this, recognizing what's going on, because he's not going to be doing it, you and I will be doing it. Okay? But. To somebody who does not trust, we have to remember, for them, distrusting us is wisdom. They see it as wise skepticism. They're not going to get sucked in. They're not going to be hurt. They're not going to be destroyed by what they, for a variety of reasons, may regard as essentially an evil outfit, an evil organization. So here he is, just by smiling and shaking hands and kissing babies. Um, and you, you keep thinking, where are the babies coming from? They're like footballs coming from all over. Um, but we're going to have to earn trust. Now, we have a, we're having a terrific assist at the moment. So let's take advantage of that. You know, I just wanted to go out in public, just wander around and say, so, you've been watching the stuff about the new poem. What do you think of them? You know, what an opportunity. Because everybody was watching. We earn, primarily earn trust through personal relationships, and that is partly why it just seeing the simplicity of Pope Francis's relationship with people, especially those who are wounded, who are handicapped, who are poor, 
people that people just their defenses just kind of melt. They think I could trust this guy. He's their bridge. Now media. The question has come up. Can media help? Absolutely. <coughs> but it needs to be understood as an assist to personal relationship. Catholics all over tend to go. Uh, I've had some people say, well, do you have like the magic book or CD or DVD that I can hand my friend who, you know, is a lax Catholic or who's hostile or whatever, and it'll just magically, no, that's the silver bullet. It can help. It depends on the person, okay? But it cannot take the place of your relationship with them. Ultimately, it is the relationship that is the most powerful thing. And of course, we're, through our relationship with them, we are calling them to a relationship with Christ in the midst of his church. So we want to model that all the way through. So, as we move a little bit further in, we come to curiosity. Now, curiosity is still essentially passive, but here they're intrigued, they're beginning to ask questions. But their defenses are still in place. They're not making a commitment. There is no commitment here. This is, this is casual curiosity. Like uh, a group of us who had entered the church together, we um, actually thought we'd create an RCA program that addressed some of the issues that we'd all struggled with when we went through RCA. So we did, and we actually thought, we found a parish who would actually let us do it. We actually put this up on it. And it was fascinating. Um, but the question became clear, what are they curious about? We thought it would be really cool if inquiry people in our RCA program read the Gospel of the Year, which happened to be Luke that year. Why not let them have an encounter with Christ through the, you know, the original Bible? And the staff person who was working with us said, well, you know, Catholics aren't Christocentric. You're being Protestant. You're showing your Protestant roots. He said, we're Trinitarian. Of course, yes, we are Trinitarian, obviously. But God became man in Jesus Christ to reveal to us, to reveal to human beings, the fullness of what God is, who he is, what his character is. That is the meaning place. That's the beginning place for us. Okay? If they meet Jesus, they meet the Father. And if they meet the Father in Jesus, they have the Holy Spirit. So, curiosity about whom? This is very important. Um, we can intentionally foster curiosity. Our culture supports curiosity. People don't want to be closed and open. They want to be open. Fine. We'll give them something to be open to. Um, one of the things they could be curious about is the possibility you could have a lived relationship with God. Remember, not just Catholics, but huge numbers of Americans don't know this is possible. 50% the Pew Foundation found that 50% of Jews, for instance, basically don't know you can have a relationship with God. They're functional atheists. Buddhists, um, any number of people, in every category, there are a huge number of Americans who don't know you can have a personal relationship with God. So it really is a new idea. And if you have one and you talk about it, you could live and be like, whoa, that's a whole new possibility I've never thought about. You can do that. Yeah, you can do that. They need to have us not overreact. This is not a place for catechesis. That's really important. We do not want to dump St. Thomas on them when they have asked, you know, one little question. We say, oh, well, you know, let's move into catechetical mode. Um, and really, the heart of it is curiosity about what. If you, we've done a study. We actually went online. My co-director, Father Mike Phones, went online and looked at RCIA advertising in parishes all over America. What question do you think they asked? And they, you know, what you put in your bulletin for your RCA program? What do you tend to? What do people say? Do you want to be Catholic? Right. Jesus was almost never mentioned. Because typically, in many RCA programs, he's treated as a topic. You know, inquiry is a mini catechesis. So we have 30 minutes on Jesus, 30 minutes on the Bible, 30 minutes on the liturgical year, 30 minutes on Mary. Do you want to be Catholic? That's pretty much how the progression works most of the time. 
And again, we're not focusing on the heart. If our goal is intentional discipleship, we must foster curiosity about the person of Jesus as the center of the faith. People who are disdainful actually know very little about him usually. And the little bit they know is probably wrong. And of course you do that, you rouse curiosity by asking questions, not by giving answers. Jesus hardly ever did Q&A. He did Q&Q. &Q. <laughs> what do you want? Why do you ask me? You know, who do you say that I am? Has no one condemned you, et cetera, et cetera. Because our job at this level of development is not catechetical. We do not want to squash people's curiosity. We want to rouse it. So the best way to do that is to ask questions in return. Remember the surface question is not often the real issue. We want to get to the real issue. Okay. There are basically uh, sort of stages of curiosity. The first is awareness. You just become aware there are alternatives you've never thought of before. And then engagement. You're now, maybe you've got friends with a Christian, maybe you're reading about Jesus, maybe you're reading the scriptures, whatever, but you're wrestling, you're beginning to wrestle. There's an amazing story <coughs> of some of a Hamas leader on the West Bank who recently was baptized as a Christian. He went through a long process. And uh, at one point he says, Somebody gave him a Bible, and he would go to the olive groves overlooking Ramallah, and I happen to have been in Ramallah and been in those olive groves. So I know, I've walked there. You can see the Sea of Galilee, I mean, the, you can see the Mediterranean off in the distance in Tel Aviv. He would go there secretly with his Bible and read it secretly for years before he ever got to the point of moving further than that. He was engaged, he was wrestling, and then as things moved on, you become more and more curious. So now you're not just listening, now you're asking questions. Now you're wrestling, you're pushing back some, you're exchanging ideas as the curiosity grows. <clears throat> so our goal, most of the time, typically Catholics think that evangelizing is being nice, not making waves. If I don't piss anybody off, I'm evangelizing. I'm sorry, but there you are. <laughs> okay. No, but that's not rousing curiosity, is it? Think about the curiosity that we're seeing just Pope Francis' simple gestures arousing in people. Um, that's, you know, forgiving those who hurt you, speaking the truth in love, honoring, having healthy relationships. Does corporal and spiritual works of mercy rouse curiosity? Caring for the poor, sharing your possessions. Don't be nice. Say outrageous things. You know, the things that make people go, hey, whoa, I didn't thought about that before. Okay, because that's, at this stage, that's what people need. That's what they need our help, is to make them more curious, not less. At this level, this is not the place for confronting lifestyle issues. This is still early stages. We want to focus on building interest and curiosity about Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Okay. I mean, we were working, I was doing a, um, uh, make, a forming, making disciples in San Francisco, down in San Francisco in January. Some of the people there were part of the, the gay community. There was a young woman who, her relationships were all still there. She was at Mass regularly. She says, why am I here? She says, it's so hard. I'm here because Jesus is the Eucharist. That was her connection. She said, if only, but the way she put it, it was a passion. You could tell she was really wrestling. So if only people would start with him and that relationship and not with the shame. You know, she got it. And, and she was still on that journey. I, I would guess she was at seeking. She was just really, really, really at the end. But nobody in her life understood. Nobody supported her. She was out there on her own, except for the parish. So we want to build that interest in Jesus. Now, when we get close to the next step, openness, we're on, this is a very difficult transition for a lot of people to make because we are talking about lowering cynicism and defenses and opening yourself to the possibility of change. We're not making a commitment here. I'm not signing on the dotted line. I'm not pretending I'm going to become Catholic or anything. But I am just saying to God and to myself, okay, I'm open. This is a really, really scary transition for a lot of people. 
Um, so funny, we had a, a man, just after I started working with this, and I actually created this, this, uh, these images, um, <coughs> a guy from, um, the, from Australia wrote me out of the blue and said he had this friend, sort of, well, acquaintance, work acquaintance, with whom he had worked for 30 years, who was an outrageous, in-your-face scientific materialist. So he was anti-religious, he was an evangelizing atheist. Right, so he was like really in your face all the time. And for 30 years they worked together, this atheist knew that this man, his friend, was a devout Catholic. Wasn't interested, wasn't interested, and then his wife died. And six months later he showed up on his friend's doorstep and wanted to talk about God. Now, a bridge of trust had been built. Obviously that's why he went there. For eight years he's been doing this, and he makes, it's just crazy making. He will borrow books, he'll borrow like Therese Lisieux's Story of the Soul, read it, come back, throw it on the table, say, that was crap, and borrow two more books. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and the, the poor man in, in um, Australia, he's writing, he says, I'm going to go crazy, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> You know, he's, you know, he's just, because he just comes and he just attacks and he attacks and he you know, gets aggressive. And then one day he said, oh, I think I want to try RCA. Do you want him in your RCA? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so naturally he goes to one meeting and says, ah, it's not for me. Nobody's surprised, right? A year later, he does it again. I think I want to try again. Okay, so they bring him in. He does the same thing, ah, not for me. You know what was fascinating? About a year ago, last summer, out of the blue, this former material atheist who looks like he's going nowhere suddenly said, and of course, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. <laughs> he's been on a long, long journey that he's almost unwilling to acknowledge openly, but it is his friend's faithfulness to stay with him despite all the crap walk with him. It has helped him move from trust to curiosity to openness and actually he's probably now on the verge of seeking or in seeking. Trust, curiosity, and openness are essentially passive. Discipleship and seeking are active, so this is really important. Even if our people are not yet disciples, but they're in seeking, they're active. It changes everything. If you have a majority of your people who are actively wrestling, the whole culture changes. But in fact, the majority of our people are in these earlier stages, and that has had a profound impact on our life of our parishes, what we consider to be normal, and our pastoral practice. I wish I had more time to talk about this, but think about it. What disciples ask of leaders is totally different than what passive people ask. <laughs> disciples want clamor for discernment. Disciples fill every you know, uh, formation opportunity in the parish, in the diocese. Disciples give, disciples worship, disciples, you know, all that stuff. It wells up from within. Because the, the Holy Spirit is released in their lives. And the fruit of the graces, the sacraments are being released in their lives. So we have adapted unconsciously our pastoral practice to the actual norm. We, our pastoral practice presumes the passivity of our people. If we're serious about making disciples, we're going to have to rethink some of this. Because they ask totally different things of us. Now, helping people move into openness. As I said, this is scary, scary stuff. And people feel crazy, out of control, it's dangerous. And you and I are going to have to have companion them, be helpers for them as they make this transition. A lot of people never get to this point. We cannot underestimate. You know, we won't see it all, but we have to realize there's a lot of fears and tensions and pressures from the outside that they are experiencing that we don't know about. And also the enemy is at work at this point. You know, so spiritual warfare becomes very important. Intercessory prayer for them becomes very important. Because they are afraid that if they let Christ enter into their lives, he's going to take really important things away. 
So our patience is really critical, like my friend in Australia. People try it on. What does it mean? You know, if I believe in God, if I had a relationship with God. And, and it's really easy for us to want to say, oh, just stop. I mean, come on, it's simple. We're nice people. This is true. Just, you know, stop and just commit and just do it. Um, but we need to be able to have the patience to go with them through this, that they need to know we're their friends. Now, there comes a point where challenge is important. But we need to, they need to know if they choose not to go any further, we're still their friend. Okay? <coughs> Intercessory prayer is very, very, very important at this stage. To help them, to, you know, all those negative things, to help them move past that. They will often need anonymity at this point. In other words, this is a private wrestling match. And we don't want to put a lot of pressure on them. I would like to suggest like, the power of exposing people who are not baptized or not believers to the presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. It changed my life. I'm happy today because I walked across the threshold of the Blessed Sacrament Church. The icon that you see of Catherine, that's our lot note that you see in our slides, she is holding Blessed Sacrament Church in Seattle, where I walked across the threshold as an undergraduate and felt the real presence of Christ. And now you understand, my head was still full of horror of Babylon. <laughs> I was looking for a place to pray because I'd gone through a conversion and intercessory prayer was one of the first gifts that emerged for me as a result. So I was looking for a place to pray during the day. Protestant churches are closed, Catholic churches are open. I didn't know why. No clues. The church is named Blessed Sacrament. Did I have any idea what that meant? Zero. Absolute nada. Okay. Um, and if you had told me, I would not have believed you anyway. So there's really no point in talking. But I walked in and I felt this presence of God. And after that, I, I you know I go to like really pretty New England, you know, Protestant churches, with the cute ones, you know, on the on that I think are so charming. And I go, it's really pretty. But that thing isn't here. The, the whatever I had no language for it, but the presence wasn't there. I had my own explanations for it. But I started hanging out in Catholic churches to do my praying because the presence was there. Now, of course, when you when you guys sort of messed up my private prayer space with your masses, <laughs> seriously, I was looking at you going, oh, those pagans. They have no idea what they're doing. You know, they're just here trying to earn their salvation, all this stuff. I mean, my, all those categories are still in my head. I don't know why they're messing up my private prayer space. Okay. Um, I've had to repent since, but... <laughs> but you know, it's accessible to anybody. People who are unbaptized, people who are completely clueless, people who are living in mortal sin, people who are all over the map can, can encounter Christ directly. And what if we took that really seriously? It can be hugely important to foster trust, curiosity, and openness. God knew if we didn't do that, we'd never get to it. That was my door in. So. Um, now, the next stage is seeking and intentional discipleship are active. We call it the zone. Thresholds four and five. Conscious, active, positive seeking. You have a lot of people who've moved into the zone. You've got a very different spiritual dynamic in your parish. Spiritual seeking, this is intentionally exploring the possibility of relationship with Christ and his church and discipleship. It is dating with a purpose. It's not casual dating anymore. Now you're saying, is this the one? Am I going to commit? So it feels like a quest. It's a real commitment. It feels like you want to come to a conclusion. You need to make a decision here. There's an urgency about this. It doesn't look so different on the outside, but inside it is experienced differently. Um, seekers want a resolution. And sometimes people who are open, just open because openness is good, you know, um, don't want to actually come to a conclusion. But seekers do. It's very important for them. And they should be seeking Jesus. This is not God in some vague, undefined, divine, you know, some kind of vague, undefined divinity. This is Jesus of Nazareth, born of the Virgin Mary, 
you know, crucified, died, risen from the dead. That Jesus. That's who they're wrestling with. Um, the church has a lot of amazing, very explicit teaching on what adult pre-baptismal disposition should look like for people to receive baptism fruitfully. <coughs> now, this is also true for older children. In other words, someone who has reached the capacity to make that decision for themselves. The issue is, where are they in their own journey in order to receive the graces of the sacraments fruitfully? You can receive it validly without it being fruitful. I love this saying. They, I, I kind of laugh when I read it because I think they're envisioning a, a different world than the one I've lived in. But the initial ardent proclamation by which a person is one day overwhelmed brought to the decision to entrust himself to Jesus Christ by faith. I don't know how many of you are hearing lots of ardent proclamations. But that is what, you know, that's what the church is envisioning. This is, um, and this is what the church formally teaches, is the spiritual place that adults should be in before baptism. So think of it before the Easter Vigil. They should have moved to initial faith by hearing the charisma, the basic story, the basic gospel story, moved freely toward God, so they're intentional, right? It's not an accident. They're believing what God has revealed, especially that we are justified by God's grace through redemption of Jesus Christ, so they have to have a basic understanding of the charisma again. They understand themselves to be a sinner, which is really, really difficult for postmodern people to do. You get somebody in Washington, D.C., in New York, in Los Angeles, in Seattle, a young adult who has been steeped in postmodernity since their birth. And sin, there's no category for that. It feels like an attack on the self. And you never do that. That's the one thing you never do is attack the self. So it's really something that typically happens at the end of the journey for people who are really steeped in the new culture. Not, you know, I have a friend who works with prison ministry in, in Houston. She says, ah, our people know they are sinners. Well, yeah. You know, if, you're, if you've been in and out of prison, if you're a drug addict, you grow up in the deep south, <laughs> you know, like I did, okay. Because the, the Greek I learned was God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, and then the second part was you're a sinner. That's your problem. Okay. He just moved right into it, okay. But for typical postmodern people, you can't do that. It's at the very end of the journey, on the edge of discipleship, that they're going to start wrestling with that in a real way. They understand corporate sin, but not individual sin. So we need to understand that's one of the things about the culture. So if they need to know they're a sinner, they need to trust in the mercy and love of God and repent. Repent of their personal sins, resolve to receive baptism or enter the church, and enter into the obedience of faith. Now this is taken literally, this is, Billy Graham did not write this, I just want you to know that. Okay? This is from the Council of Trent. This is the decree on justification from the Council of Trent. So it is 450 years old. But that's what's supposed to be a place before baptism, okay? Seekers are kind of wrestling with that. They count the cost. This is not fire insurance. This is not Daniel going out to kill that guy in a battle and you know going through a rope prayer to make sure he doesn't go to hell. Okay. This is, I understand as personal applications. I'm wrestling with repentance, I'm wrestling with sin, I'm wrestling with will I say yes and follow Jesus Christ as Lord in this, in this church. Now, we may need to help people move into this by challenging them to move deliberately into seeking. We will have to help them confront issues like relativism of our culture, personal sin, what it means to follow Jesus as a disciple. And at that point, we need to be sharing our personal discipleship with them, our experience, our prayer life. And that is very scary for us. I do understand. It's not that you're, listen, you don't have to be a saint. I know most of us think I'm a bad Catholic. I think that all the time. You know, I'm not doing this perfectly. I don't have all the devotion that I'm supposed to have. I don't, you know, every time I read something in the catechism or in the theology, I think, oh, I'm not doing that yet. I'm not living it. I'm not living it. Okay. So you feel bad. 
it's vastly more important that your relationship be real than that it be perfect. The reality is what matters, that you are on the journey. And then discipleship, as they move into that. People can't seek forever, and becoming a disciple uses different muscles than seeking. It's a different way of life. And some people get used to seeking, and they never make a commitment. So we may need to challenge them at this point, to actually encourage them to make a decision, to ask, ask them explicitly. And if they say no, it's not over. It's not like, oh, well, that, that was the end of that. Because we need to understand, what, would the, what's, what are the barriers, what are the blocks as they understand them? It's not that they need to have figured out all the doctrinal issues, because this is a different thing. You know, it's perfectly appropriate just to help someone drop their nets before they enter the church. In the RCA, somewhere in that process, they don't have to figure out what they believe about every, you know, doctrinal jot and tittle. That's a different issue. Help them focus on the central issues of Christ and his call to follow him. <coughs> um, spiritual warfare again becomes very intense at this stage, just like at, the, at openness. Um, so intercessory prayer is really important. <clears throat> so we can have all kinds of journeys. On Sunday, next <clears throat> next Sunday, take a moment and stand and look at the people in your sanctuary who are gathered. And think of them not just as, you know, well, they're here, so they're all going to be Catholics. Think of them as a whole group of people, all of whom are in different parts of the journey. And it's more like this. There's some of them, you know, this is the Catholic dream journey. Where you just you were raised as a child, you accepted it all, you internalized it all, you become a disciple, you never leave, and you always do the right thing. Well, you know, this is like one half of one percent, but that's our that's our dream. Um, my co-director did that. I hate him. Um, anyway, <laughs> people who are perfect. So some of us, you know, our couch potatoes, we have never moved. We didn't even know there, there was any place to move to. We were just baptized, and that's our identity. You know, that's okay. Some of us are like my friend in Australia who are in the torture journey. Agony, agony, fighting it all the way. But they're moving. And other people, I mean, they're all over the map. There's some people who make the journey to discipleship and they're not even baptized yet. But they're, they're there, the disposition is in place. And other people, you know, they come, they get as far as openness and then they, they just head on out. They can't make that transition. And then there's the classic revert. You know, who's gone away and is coming back, and every variation thereof. Our congregations are filled with thousands of people all who are on a different journey, okay? And so we think of it as a living thing, as a moving thing. And our goal as evangelists, as evangelizers, is to meet them where they are, wherever that is, and help them move closer to Christ, continue on that journey. Um, we tend to repeat this journey at different points of conversion in our own lives. People like me who are already disciples but enter the church from the outside. I went through all of this myself in terms of regarding the Catholic Church. Um, it also happens at really important points of discernment or decision making or critical obedience as we will often retrace the same steps with regard to that issue. What happens when people go finish this, when they actually cross, they drop their nets, they cross into discipleship, is critical. Typically what we have done, in even our evangelizing work in like retreats, RCA, what happens after RCA? You get dropped in the big Catholic ocean. <laughs> Good luck, hope you can swim. <laughs> oh, we gave you water rings, didn't we? Well, maybe not. A lot of our people drown. <clears throat> they need a tremendous amount of support right after that. They need Ananias. Remember who Ananias was? The man who was sent to, Pete, to Paul after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was blinded. He was, and, and Ananias was literally sent by the Lord to go place his hands on this man, pray for his healing, restore his sight, and then basically kind of help him through that very earliest stages. Introduce him to the community. He was his companion, his very first companion in the faith. It was critical. If St. Paul needed it, you and I need it. So 
every disciple needs an Ananias or an Ananias community of, or small group of some kind with people who have some understanding because they're disciples themselves, they make this journey themselves of what it is like to cross that threshold and what your questions are like. And so people are saying, what does this mean? What has just hit me? Is this normal? You know, these things I'm feeling, these things I'm experiencing, what is that? What is that? You know, somebody needs to be with them. We cannot simply drop them out of an intense evangelizing experience into the community. Or even like Catholics come home. Did you do that here? Catholics come home, though. Okay. It's a lot of parish dioceses did it. I uh, have done it. Um, lots of people often come back. But what happens, the studies indicate a year later, the numbers are basically the same. Now, part of it is because some people stay, but other people are still leaving. Uh, part of it is that the people who come back don't stay because the problem with this, I mean, the Catholics come home is very effective in rousing, start, you know, restarting trust, rousing curiosity, to get people back in the door, but then it's up to the parish to A, notice they're there, res, you know, help them in some way, and help them address the issues that led them away in the first place. But almost nowhere um, in any diocese I've ever worked in was there any plan or provision to do that most essential work. And so it's just like they're coming out of RCA, they're dropped in the big Catholic ocean, and a lot of them drown. So we're working on this right now. Um, I have a, a friend who's actually uh, has done a beta version of Ananias training, and she's working on that right now. Because we know this is a hugely important issue, and most parishes don't have people ready to do this. So at the very end, how do you build a culture where discipleship is normal? I'm not saying where everybody is disciple. That doesn't happen. But where it is now normative, instead of just being a trust, to be a disciple. We need to be asking where people are in their lived relationship with God. We need to break the silence by do ask, listening very well, recognizing these where they are in their actual journey, these spiritual thresholds, and therefore responding appropriately to where they are in their journey, articulating the basic gospel in a way that invites intentional discipleship, you know, explicitly, challenging them to make that decision, supporting it you know, celebrating it. And we need many, many people in our parishes, not just a few. A pastor cannot do this by himself. A lay staff person cannot do this by himself. Uh, uh, no matter how passionate an evangelizer is, this is a work for the community. Okay? And we need many people at multiple levels of leadership, up and down, who are there to help understand the journey, are there to help people at those critical moments, and have these basic skill sets. So essentially, that's why I wrote the book. Uh, I'm going to stop right here. I don't know where I am in time. OK. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Just coming up with all members of back to offer a closing reflection and prayer. And then we'll have a time of break for those who are still staying for the 12 to 2 session. Um, and we'll get started right at 12. Others, uh, many of my colleagues here from the Chancery offices, this wraps up the uh, Chancery study morning. So, Bishop Lurie. Thank you. Well, in the way I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> you have really shared so much with us that is uh, so profoundly practical and wise. But at least for me, it's going to take a while to, you know, to go down and kind of, how do we do personally? But, but wonderful paths of the wonderful understanding of the different stages. But I think what's basic, and you actually were saying this all along, is we who are here, well, we ourselves have to ask that question. Where are we with Jesus? And is he the center of our life? Really the center of our life. And for all of us, beginning with me, we can become much more deeply in love with the Lord. Because if I listen carefully to my married friends, 
they will tell me, those who have successful marriages, not perfect, but marriages that are deepening in love, and they, will, they never stop growing in love. Sixty years married, we can still grow in our love. If that's true in that dimension, it's going to be true in the life of the, of the disciple of Jesus. So as I see it, first of all, we have been given a wonderful invitation today through charity to ourselves look within and see how can we become more deeply in love with, with the Lord? How can we let Him grasp our heart? and draw us into his heart. That was the first question I think you asked us to consider. Those were three questions that started. So. so I think that's the first thing for us to do because it's amazing to think that people who are in leadership roles, whether they're clergy, religious, or laity, can be there and still not be in love with the Lord. In one sense it seems amazing. How could that be? But it is. So, that's very humbly, great confidence. After all, Jesus loves us so much that he doesn't want us not to be with him. Be not afraid. Come close. So that's the first thing that you've, you've been the instrument of God for us to do. And then with that is, is all of the other understanding we need and how to approach people walk with them, be a companion. How we can look into our pastoral practice. And that's going to take some examination. But nonetheless, these are very challenging but life-giving directions you provided for us. So, uh, I'm grateful for all of you who've come. Some I know will be we leaving now to some will go across the some will be going across the parking lot. Uh, perhaps, I don't know. Not, I don't know who signed up to lunch, and I'm not going to check. <laughs> but for those who will be leaving us, wherever you're headed, may you have not only really a safe journey there, but may you go encouraged, encouraged by this wonderful morning. And sure, we'll continue to pray for you for all that you are and doing. You know, the evil one does not want success. And he's very, very clever. And he has all sorts of ways of getting at us. Some more overt, and others more subtle. And because he understands that the overt ones we recognize a little more easily, he then does the more subtle ones. And so we, he's not to scare us, it's just to be to no, we need prayer. We need that trust before our Lord. We need the prayer of others. So, we send you with our prayer, our affection. May you be that instrument of the Lord he's raised up to be his evangelist. So God bless all of you and all your efforts. And know that um, all that we do is a carrying out of who we are. First and foremost and always, we have been missioned by Jesus, consecrated at baptism to be evangelizers. So thank you. No, I pray for you too. And I only ask one thing. Pray for me too. For I do have to be drawn to the deeper love of Jesus. Thank you and God bless you. And we say to you. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Lord, our hearts are filled with gratitude as we come to the end of this morning. We are grateful for the presence of Sherry, of how you used her to be a messenger to us, to call us to a deeper union with you, to enable us to see how we might be more faithful, loving companions to those who are on a journey from mistrust to trust, all the way to discipleship. Help us, Lord, for we are weak, but you chose weak people, and you will strengthen us so that only we will be open to you. We ask the help too, dear Lord, of your Holy Mother Mary, 
for she has only one word of advice for us. Do whatever he tells you. And what do you tell us, Lord? To love our God and to love one another. And so we ask to the help of St. Joseph and St. Paul, the great evangelizer. Dear Lord, all these things we, we place before you. And we praise you, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Bring us one day into the eternal life that you have prepared for us. We will pray all this through you, Lord Jesus. You live in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and we'll rethink being at 12 o'clock for those things.